Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and I'm going to tell you about flight testing the Airbus 319. Now, this is kind of an interesting situation, uh, because this was back in 95, and at the time, uh, United Airlines was thinking of a re buying replacement aircraft, and they were trying to decide, ah, between 37, 737s, and uh, the Airbus fleet, because they already had 320s and stuff like that. And they're, they're looking at, you know, a little shorter one, they're thinking about the, the 319. And uh, this is also during the time when we had the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership Program, which was a real, yeah, whatever. Um, uh, supposedly we're owners, but yeah, anyway, uh, half a million dollars worth of worthless stock I got out of that. But at the time, there was a little more excitement about it, and it was going to be fun and everything. And I'm in a meeting uh, with a bunch of management people and pilots and that. And they're talking about, you know, well, which aircraft do we want to look at? Well, uh, McDonnell Douglas had the MD-90 at the time, and they're going, wait a minute, wait a minute, we got this airplane too, we want, it, we want to be involved in it. And, you know, United was kind of going, yeah, whatever, right, you know. They weren't too interested, but uh, all right, all right, and you can, we'll, we'll consider you. Okay, well, I'm at this meeting, and Doug was the chief pilot on the uh, Airbus fleet. And they wanted a management pilot to come over and fly the 319. Well, in the whole group there, I, I had a 737 type rating. I was flying the 727 as captain. I was not typed on the Airbus aircraft, although I'd flown them a number of times in flight test. And I'd also flown the MD-90 in, in flight test. So uh, Doug said, well, you're the only one who's got experience in all three of these aircraft. Uh, why don't you go over there and fly it? And I go, okay, that sounds like fun. Now, this was uh, very early in on the program, and it's, it's uh, earlier than they like to typically get people uh, involved in uh, flying the aircraft. In fact, I was the first non-Airbus test pilot to fly the 319, which was kind of cool. And it was only uh, two months into a, a seven-month program, so it was very early early in the development of the aircraft so a lot of the tweaks of the flight control laws now you know this is all fly by wire and stuff and they got the boxes the sex and and all this other stuff you know uh but um uh, they got a tweak it for each airplane because the the uh the 319 was essentially a 12 foot shorter version of the 320 and if you don't notice uh typically uh, you see there, there's only one uh, overwing exit uh, window there, escape hatch. Uh, the 320 has two, so if you're walking up the terminal, that's the easiest way to see it. Uh, it's not quite so noticeable once you get into the aircraft. But um, So uh, the interesting thing was, I was over in Europe anyway. I flew the, uh, the Dornier uh, 328 uh, prop aircraft on October 23 of 95 and hey I was right there and, and I said well I can just hop over to Toulouse so I went from Munich to Toulouse and I flew the 319 uh, three days later on uh, uh, October uh, 26 of uh, 1995. Okay, so of course I do this flight evaluation, I write it up, it goes in the Alpha magazine, and uh, yeah, you're looking at that going, what is that guy? That's not a window. What's he doing there? Well, that is what, for you new pilots, we call a second officer. There was a time in the past when, and it, I'm not talking about um, the Outer Limits Flight 33, where they had a, a captain, co-pilot, flight engineer, navigator, and radio operator, where they had five people in the cockpit. We had three. We would have three. In fact, they tried to put three on the 737, which is a whole other issue I talk about. Uh, that was a disaster. But anyway, uh, and actually I was uh, a third person on the 737. I'm digressing. See the shirt? Yeah. Well, I'm actually getting some new shirts. I'm, you, you're going to like them. You're going to love them, actually. They're beautiful. But, uh, and Tom Wilson was very helpful on one of the designs, too. Uh, I'll show you. Those are cool. But anyway, I digress. Okay, uh, so very common to have three people, and this is probably one of the last times one ever occurred on the cover because uh, these guys were on their way out, of course, being a 727 captain. I had one. But okay, here I am in the Alpha magazine, and let's see, we're looking at it here. Uh, I'm not number one, two, oh, well, I guess they're, they're not as excited about me anymore. I'm second from the bottom there. But uh, anyway, I, I got the article here, and I'll, I'll post a link if you want to uh, download it and read the article. Uh, if you didn't save it from uh, 20 nine years ago oh man 
You're worse pack rat than me, although I have several copies of it here. But anyway, there's the article. And uh, like I said, you can download it. You don't want to read it here or anything. And look at that very young pilot there sitting in the seat. Now, one of the test pilots uh, I dealt with quite a bit was E.N.T. Taranowski. Uh, we called him E.T. And, uh, of course, when you come over there as a Union pilot, uh, and you fly their aircraft, like when I flew the 321, they gave you this nice little model of the 321. See, I'm a, a Union pilot who comes over and flies it. Well, uh, I show up, and uh, E.T. has a rather larger model for me, thinking I'm a, a management person, because they asked to send the management person over. Oh, you see this thing? That They called it a sail on the Airbus. Uh, not a winglet. Uh, they called it a sail. They didn't want to, you know, seem like they're uh, following any other aircraft. You notice it's missing here? Uh, bad cat. The cat chewed off. You can even see teeth marks on my model. That was I, I was not happy with that cat. Uh, he lived a long life, but I was not happy with that. But anyway, I show up, and E.T.'s got this big model, and he's looking at me, and he goes, the first thing he says is, I know you. And I go, of course you know me. And he says, are you in management? Now and I go no no they sent me over and he goes oh because they were expecting a management part and then I explained what an ESOP was and he had no idea what an ESOP was but okay kind of looked at, well anyway well I'll show you the airplane so uh, we went out and we flew uh, we flew the aircraft and, and it was it was quite interesting like I said we're very early in the development of the aircraft so uh, there were a lot of things about the way the aircraft flew that were not how uh, they wanted the, uh, the the final development. And the other thing is something you typically don't want on a demonstration flight, which is kind of what this was, was they had a mix of engines. Uh, they had one engine, uh, the right engine contained a double annular combustor. Uh, and as a result, uh, the EGT uh, at idle and the accelerations were different so it was a little bit weird there you had to be careful because the uh, the engines would come up uh, separately but um, it was uh, it was uh, quite interesting to fly early on in in the test program now it, it was very interesting to see the development of the control laws and one issue they had was with the pitch response in configuration three. Now, uh, the Airbus had basically four configurations, uh, setting one, two, three, and four. They made it simple. They didn't go flaps 20, 30, or they didn't have like McDonnell Douglas where you could dial to flap, where you could essentially select any flap setting you wanted, uh, which allowed, you know, a lot of variation. I'm digressing here. But anyway, they had one, two, three, and four. So we're looking at uh, setting number three. And for configuration four, a three that slats at 22 degrees and flaps at 20 degrees um, so I slowed it uh, in configuration three slowed to about 140 knots and then I set uh, maximum continuous uh, thrust and now the Airbus flight controls they're going for flight path stability now normally when you advance power with an underslung engine it will pitch the nose up and yeah they leave a little bit of that in so it seems like it's got you know typical performance but basically uh, you don't want the pitch really to change. That's part of the uh, flight path stability that they're, they're going for in, in their design. And uh, with no pilot input, it uh, pitched up to 4 degrees and gave about 800 foot per minute uh, climb rate. Now what they wanted uh, was um, it to pitch up to 3 degrees. That, that was kind of their goal. And all these things took a little tweak. And of course, uh, you got to justify controls for the flap setting and uh, things like that. Now... Um, we, uh, we did a, a, a number of things that I flew it in direct law, and that's where um, the pilot directly controls uh, the flight control services, and you have to use manual pitch trim, uh, speeds limited to 320 knots, indicated 0.77 Mach, the protections are lost, and uh, you have to use the speed brake uh, with care and the, the rudder with care. Those are the, the warnings that uh, pitch up. And one thing I looked at in this configuration was the, uh, the Dutch roll. And uh, basically, um, we, we went to configuration four, which was the highest flap setting. And uh, with both the yaw dampers off, I, I did a, a 10 degree steady uh, side slip. And uh, I, I put the rudder in and then released it. And we got a very nice, well damped Dutch roll. In about 40 seconds, it, uh, it, it finished the Dutch roll, it damped out. And 
that's without pilot inter intervention. So it's very well uh, controlled there. Uh, basically, with the odd ampers on, it was deadbeat, which means you put the 10 degrees in, it comes right back uh, to neutral. No overshoots, no uh, you know typical uh, Dutch roll uh, yawing around stuff like that. So you know it's very well, uh, very well uh, contained. Now, then I want to do some landing attitude stalls, and uh, uh, we trimmed to 127 knots, and I maintain back pressure, and of course, uh, to do this, uh, you have to be out of normal law, and, and uh, they asked me when I was going through training, uh, how do you get into uh, direct law, and I said, well, I usually ask Alonzo uh, to set us in direct law, and they go, no, 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 that's not the right answer. The answer is multiple system failures. Okay, well, that's pretty easy. So anyway, uh, I trimmed 127 knots, and I increased the pitch uh, to 13 and a half uh, degrees angle of attack, and that's where I got the stall warning. And of course, uh, that's where uh, most of the time that, that people recover. You recover on the first indication of a stall. That's the way they train you and stuff like that. But in flight test, of course, we want to go into the stall to see what the actual uh, characteristics are. So I continued uh, to s uh, slow, and I got the stall break at about 99 knots, and a angle of attack of 22 degrees. Got just a little bit of airframe buffet, and I got the uh, the right wing uh, to drop. And then one thing I did, and, and this is one thing that's nice about uh, the Airbus. We're, we're back into normal law here, and uh, I set up for a collision escape maneuver, and that's basically where you see Oh my gosh, there's an airplane there, and uh, you know most of the time you have to worry about yanking back on the stick. You might stall the aircraft and stuff like that. The nice thing about Airbus, you just pull back on that stick, pull it in the corner, you know, a climbing bank turn, engines come roaring in, uh, as long as it doesn't think you're landing. That's another story. But the engines come roaring in, and you don't over-G it. You go right to what's known as alpha floor, which is the max performance of the aircraft. And we were uh, had an alpha of six doing this maneuver. We had an alpha of 16 degrees angle of attack and a pitch attitude of 21 degrees. Uh, we were climbing at 106 knots. Now anybody who flies transport aircraft knows that 106 knots is kind of a slow speed. But hey, we're fully protected there, and that's kind of cool. And I had a climb rate of about uh, 2,200 feet per minute, which is uh, obviously uh, pretty darn uh, decent. And, um, uh, yeah, we flew a few other maneuvers. Uh, I came back to shoot a few patterns. I asked to be placed in direct law for landing, and that's where you have to use manual trim. And um, uh, the aircraft was very controllable. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting, and if you're familiar with the term in, in vino veritas, in uh, wine is truth. The maximum roll rate uh, in normal law is limited to 15 degrees. Now, the, uh, and this is a funny thing. If, if you have a degraded flight control law, you actually increase the roll rate because you go to the natural roll rate of the aircraft, which is around 30 degrees. And the other thing is there is what's known as a tau function, which is how rapidly uh, the ailerons essentially effectiveness ramps up. And you want that to be smooth. When you go into a turn, you want the ailerons to come in nice and smoothly. You want the roll to be smooth. But uh, this aircraft... Uh, will it actually has a very steep function, and you put the uh, you put the sick in uh, in in direct law, and you you get almost a head banging roll there. It's it's very effective, and I and I commented that you know it's interesting that you get better roll performance in a degraded uh, flight control law, if you will, uh, than you do in in normal law. But uh, interesting thing that probably a lot of Airbus test pilots don't uh, Airbus pilots don't know is that, okay, the maximum roll rate is set at 15 degrees. It used to be 20 degrees. And they did some flight tests, and they actually got into a very serious lateral pilot-induced oscillation of uh, some 20, uh, 60, 60 degrees bank to bank. Uh, the guy was trying to control. Uh, it was They, they brought in uh, some pilots uh, to fly it, uh, fly the uh, 320 early on. And, uh, of course, Airline pilots do things differently than test pilots, and that's where they learn some extra little things that they didn't know about. Uh, and this was one of them that you could excite uh, the pilot-induced oscillation. And they found when you allowed a, a normal uh, a roll rate of 20 degrees, you could get into that PIO. So they backed it off to 15. 
I took a few sessions talking with the Airbus test pilots in some nice restaurants in Toulouse, having a couple glasses of wine uh, where this kind of came out. And uh, they, they told me uh, what's known as the rest of the story. So, look at that young guy there. My gosh, nice dark blonde hair. So, uh, this was the earliest that Typically, uh, you'll get a demonstration flight in an aircraft because they're trying to sell it to United Airlines at the time. They wanted us to get us over there and uh, flying it, so that was fine. So, you know, the, the whole story is they, they've got uh, control laws they need to develop and stuff like that, but it gave us a, a pretty good entry into it. And uh, I wrote up a report, and I compared the, uh, the three aircraft, and uh, uh, basically, uh, my recommendation, and I guess they followed it because they bought the 319. Uh, of course, it wasn't the only input. But anyway, uh, my recommendation was I thought the 319 was a very good fit for this from the pilot standpoint. Of course, there's a lot more uh, things. You, you, you look at basically, you know, is the airplane going to serve the market? So, you know, pilots will fly. <laughs> Uh, you know, anything. So, uh, you know, but it, it's probably more the marketing people and all the people, the bane counters who determine, you know, is, is this aircraft good? But my recommendation was I like I like the 319. The MD-90, you know, we're, we're not going to start another new fleet. I mean, it, that was kind of a nice try, McDonnell Douglas, but uh, uh, no, we weren't, we weren't interested in that. Uh, so anyway, that is the story of my adventure flying the, uh, the 319. It was kind of funny. Uh, are fun to go directly from the Dornier 328 prop over to fly uh, the 319 in Toulouse. And when I was uh, uh, going through customs there, the uh, customs agent asked me, he says, so how long are you in uh, in France? Because I went through, uh, uh, you know, I entered uh, through customs there in, in Toulouse. And I said, I will be here less than 24 hours because I had to get back to fly a trip. So I was there, uh, got to fly the airplane. We went out for a nice little evening meal. Uh, the nice thing about this job is I got to see all the really nice restaurants in Toulouse and ate a lot of really cool French food. Um, but uh, uh, I was back on a flight early morning the next day to get back home. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little story. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it.